Well, good morning. Just so you know, I had a hard time watching that part of the clip, and there's another four minutes of that. You'll notice we're not watching it, because the pastor's like, nope, all I can handle, although it is hilarious. And what's funny is we have uh, a member that works at the DMV who was here last night for church, and uh, I, I said, is there anybody at the DMV like, like, uh, that, that, acts like, that is like that? And I got no answer. So I didn't get a definitive no either, so I'm just saying. Um, you know, today we're going to talk about waiting and praying, and uh, the truth is praying compared to waiting is easy, and uh, uh, we don't like to wait. Now, I don't know if you've had somebody tailgating you, you know, going through a, a neighborhood or something, and then you pull up to the next light, and they're next to you, and you're like, ha, 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 and I also don't know if you've been the one that passed somebody and then got caught at the next light, <laughs> right? We're, we're so impatient. Listen, you realize that years ago they had to make a fire in order to cook, and we microwave popcorn and think, four minutes? That is crazy, Tuck. We ordered a pizza last night, 55 minutes. <gasps> what will we do? 55, a pizza? It should be here in like 12 seconds, is it right? And do you remember when they used to have a 30-minute guarantee? Do you guys remember those days? Way before the pandemic, right? And so what's happened in our society is, if we're honest, we've just gotten spoiled. Think about this. If you raise a child and every time they ask for something, you give it to them instantly. What does that child become like? A monster? <laughs> Last night I heard brat. But they become spoiled, right? And yet, if we're honest... We not only want to answer God to answer our prayers the way we want him to, by the way, not the way he wants to, the way we want him to. God, we have this prayer request. And by the way, sometimes if I'm praying with you, I'll say, and Lord, I'm selfish and this is what I want. And uh, I was joking with somebody the other day. I said, you know, it's funny. I want the hurricane to just turn a little more left and then I feel guilty. I'm like, wait a second. I'm saying, God, don't let it hit me. Let it hit them. And I'll never forget being at a church that said, we prayed and that hurricane went to North Carolina. And I remember thinking, uh, were they not praying as well as we were? You know, how does this work? Right. And so when we pray, sometimes not only do we want God to answer the prayers the way we want. You ready? We want him to answer when we want. We're like the spoiled kid. If you, God, if you don't answer how I want, when I want, the way I want, I just don't believe you anymore. And we are those spoiled kids. As we get to James chapter 5, and by the way, I encourage you, we have gone through the book of James. I know we ran through it. It's like going over the Grand Canyon in a plane and going, there it is. But I encourage you to read the book of James. It doesn't take that long to read. There's some great things that we didn't get to talk about, but we got to hit the highlights and talk about some things. And today we're going to talk about this important subject of waiting and praying. Now, I did not bring the right kind of soap, so you'll have to forgive me, but... Uh, how many of you have ever seen ivory soap? You've seen ivory soap, right? Okay. So what do we know about ivory soap? You can just yell it out. This is not a classroom. It floats, right? That's what you know about ivory soap. The difference between Dove, which has this beautiful smell, so I'll have to put it over there. Uh, the difference between Dove and ivory is you throw ivory in a bathtub. As well. So ivory is over 100 years old. You have to realize back 100 years ago, Families all took baths one at a time in the same tub of water. Oh, how fun that must have been. Uh, um, and the Three Stooges, it was Saturday night, right? Wasn't that what they told us? But so, so oldest to youngest, right? So the baby's going in. La you can't find the soap by then unless you had ivory soap because it's just floating around. You're like, oh, there's the soap. We're good, right? And by the way, that's really disgusting. None of you are going to be listening to the rest of the sermon. But, but here's the truth. Here's the truth. It was created by accident. Ivory soap was created by accident. One of the workers was blending the soap and went to lunch. And he came back and he went, oh no. But it looked okay, so he poured it and cut it. Now here's the, where the story gets funny. There's a dispute about which happened. And I'm guessing it's the family versus the company. So I'm going to say the way the company... First I'll tell you what he said, or his family says, and then I'll tell you what the company says. So... The family says he went to his manager and told what happened and then decided they would distribute it anyway. 
The company story goes, he didn't tell anybody. I tend to believe that one, by the way, because it looked the same, and they cut it up, and they sent out all these bars of soap. And here's what happened over 100 years ago. People started coming back and going, I want that soap. And they're like, what do you mean? This different soap. What are you talking about? You know, this special soap you made. What special soap? And then they showed how it floated. And then, of course, the guy was like, um, yeah, I uh, one day went to lunch. I was getting a sandwich, and uh, I came back, and um, it looked normal, so I mixed it. And, but it ended up to be the best mistake. Why? Because of the extra time that mixed in more air so that it floats. Now, here's what that has to do with you. We're all in a hurry for God to do what we want when we want. But he is creating in you a special person who can only minister and encourage and bless and be who he's made you to be. And in order to do that, it takes slow cooking. It takes time. And so we're going to look at this today. And so here's your first point. Be patient, but also be expectant. By the way, we're usually patient and complaining, right? We're usually patient and aggravated. Patient and expectant is not what we usually are. And here we go. By the way, the beginning of this chapter is about the rich oppressing the poor. And basically he says, hey, if you're wealthy and you're hurting poor people, you're in big trouble. And then he addresses the people that are on the other end of that, the people being oppressed. And he says this, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. This is why we have a harvest festival. Why? Because we're so excited. Hey, look, something actually came up. By the way, bamboo story that's being posted online, I was going to use that today. You know, it takes five years before you ever see. It's a lie. It's a lie. I read it, and then I thought, oh, what a great illustration. So, of course, I have to make sure it's true, and it's not. It's not. They sprout the first year, just not very big, and they sprout the second year, just not very big, and then they sprout the fourth year. Anyway, and then they grow 90 feet. But they do sprout, so you see something. So the harvest, though, still you have to wait. You still have to wait. And then it continues. You too, be patient and stand firm. Why? Because the Lord's coming is near. And then listen to what he says here. And I want to I go back to this. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you'll be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Now, it's funny because we read like this as, oh, no. The judge is at the door. He's listening to what I'm saying. But there's really two ideas here. One is, oh no, the judge is standing at the door. God is there and near. But that's the other thought. We need to recognize that God is near. No matter how you feel, no matter what you're walking through, no matter what you're dealing with, God is near. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. You know, like Jeremiah. He, he wasn't a bullfrog. You know, I mean, I mean, these prophets would speak in the name of the Lord and then, and then things wouldn't go the way they want, thought they would, should go. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. So this is not just waiting and going, I guess I'm not doing anything. I mean, if you're in a boat and there's a hole in the boat, guess what you should do until you figure out how to patch the hole? Bail, right? It's not like, well, I'm just going to wait for God to come, right? You know, about the, you know the story about the guy in the flood, right? First, a car comes and says, hey, we're going we're gonna to get you out of here. Second guy comes in a boat, hey, we're going to get you out of here. Third time, the guy's on the roof, a helicopter comes, hey, we're going to get you out of here. The guy dies and goes to heaven. And the whole time he had been praying, God, you're going to save me. God, you're going to save me. God, you're going to save me. He gets to heaven. He goes, God, why didn't you save me? He goes, I sent three people to get you. Right? Too often, we're just waiting for God and saying, God, what do you want me to do while I'm waiting? You've heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. So what do we need to know in a storm? What do we need to know in this time of waiting? You know, when I was a kid, Miami, we had awful storms, lightning like crazy in Miami. I don't know if you knew that. And so um, we had pine trees. And so there were several times that the pine trees were hit. And uh, one time when one of the pine trees was hit, 
the, uh, the lightning came down the roots, went under our porch, and broke bricks out of the back porch, like, like created a hole in the back porch of the bricks. So scary lightning storms. So I can remember as kids, my brother and I were really little, and the storm would start, and we would go into, we would go into my parents' room and, and say, can we lay on the floor? And we would lay on the floor. And the next thing we'd know, my older sisters, who were a little bit older than me, would show up and go, can we lay on the floor in here? And I'll never forget a really bad storm. My teenage brother, when I was still a little kid, my teenage brother comes in. I just wanted to check on you guys, right? And he lays on the floor because the storm was so bad. But there was something about what? Being there with our parents that we felt safe. Listen. No matter what you're walking through right now, recognize that God is with you. And when you're waiting, also be expectant. God, I know somehow you're going to work this out. God, I know you're going to work this out for the good. And so you just trust him in the middle of that. Recognize his presence while waiting. Here's a quote from Brother Lawrence. The most holy and necessary practice in our spiritual life, listen, is the presence of God. By the way, if you've never read anything by Brother Lawrence, just Google it. And, uh, uh, and then he says... That means finding constant pleasure in his divine company, speaking humbly and lovingly with him in all seasons, at every moment, without limiting the conversation in any way. Number two, so not only be patient and expect, number two, pray and praise alone and with others. You know, this week I had uh, an appointment down in uh, Rockledge, almost Melbourne, and then uh, I had another appointment up here, and then I... Uh, had an appointment here at the office and the people were late. And I thought, well, in the meantime, I'm going to come in and pray over each chair and pray for the people who will sit in these chairs for the years to come. It's great. So I got to pray over each chair and ask God, God, would you just bless this time? And I know that God blesses, but you know what? He also blessed me by doing that and helped me think of a lot of you guys. And I prayed for, for many of you during that time. But I also look forward, you know, I've had my small group come in and we've prayed over this building and prayed over this thing. We've prayed for people together. It's important that you not only take time to pray yourself, but you also take time to pray with other people. I think in our society, because we've so isolated ourselves that we've gotten unused to praying with and for other people. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Listen to what it says here, James 5, 13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. If anyone among you is sick, let them call the elders of the church and pray over them. Anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. By the way, if you call me and ask me to come and pray for you, I always pray for you. Uh, and if you say, God, uh, please anoint me with oil, I carry anointing oil with me. Now, what is anointing oil? What is it for? Anointing oil represents two things. Yeah, bring her closer to the service. That was smart. Uh, uh, the, the anointing... <laughs> go yell at your husband. Uh, uh, okay, so anointing oil represents two... Th yeah, you can shut this. Anointing oil represents two things. Number one, healing. But number two, anointing of kingship. And it's a way of saying, God, you're in charge. God, you're in charge. And sometimes when we're praying, we need to acknowledge, you know what, God? You're in charge of what happens next. And sometimes we just need to take the time to do that. Now, let me tell you what this wasn't. This wasn't people on their deathbed getting ready to die and they had to get the pastor there right before they die or they weren't going to make it. And some denominations and some groups have changed this passage to somehow mean if the priest doesn't get there in time, well, I guess I'm going to purgatory. But man, if he makes it. So we're reliant on the speed of the priest in order to get into heaven. Now, what an excuse to an officer, though. That's the only reason I can think that's it. But that's not what this passage is talking about. It's talking about praying for other people. And then it continues. If they've sinned, they'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. Listen, you should at least have one person who you can talk to about your struggles. And if you don't have that person, find someone that you can trust. It's got to be somebody you can trust. And by the way, be careful that you don't make sins a lot more public than the offense. That's a, that's a big caution. I don't have time to go into that, but just, just take that for what it's worth. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Time out. I got to tell you something about this. 
People say, oh, well, righteous person, let's get the pastor. And let me tell you something awesome about the Bible. The Bible says when you become a Christian because of your position, not because of how holy you are or that you got everything right or you don't drive like the pastor, because of that, the Bible says you're made righteous. So believe it or not, when you pray for people, the prayer of a righteous person, somebody who's given their life to Christ, is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. Elijah, very human. Struggled with depression, by the way. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. So I want to give you some practical things. Listen. When you're at work, now, I will tell you, when you're at work, you're also to be a good steward of your work. So please don't stop what you're doing at work and take an hour to pray for somebody, you know, uh, unless you are at a workplace where flexibility is the key and it doesn't matter. But don't take your employer's money and then do whatever you want, okay? But here's the deal. Sometimes when somebody says something to you, hey, I'm really struggling, or they tell you about a hurt, you can do one of two things, and it kind of depends on your situation. You can say to them, I'll be praying for you. Or you can say, can I pray for you right now? And don't be afraid. Listen, a prayer doesn't have to be anything complicated. You can say, Lord, would you help my friend, blah, 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 with this situation? Amen. By the way, if you pray that short, people will go, that's it? I thought we were going to pray for missionaries and soup and, right? Okay? But if you pray that way, guess what? More people won't mind praying with you. And the truth is, that's really what you wanted to pray anyway, right? You just wanted to pray for them. So don't be afraid to just pray one thing. It's okay. Do you know what a prayer is? Help. That's a prayer. Thanks. That's a prayer. A prayer doesn't have to be complicated. So you can say to somebody, hey, can I pray for you? Or I'll be praying for you. Don't be afraid to stop where you are. Sometimes when you go to lunch. Now, I want you to be careful because realize waitresses want you to, and waiters want you to be happy. So I've talked to all kinds of people who love to witness to their waiter and waitress. And you've got to find the balance because people will become Christians if they think you're going to tip better become Christians if they think you're going to tip better. So be careful about that. But sometimes I'll say to the waiter or waitress, hey, we're getting ready to pray for our lunch and we're going to pray for you. And sometimes they'll say, oh, could you pray for this? By the way, how many of you have ever been to lunch? Anybody? A couple people in here? Okay, good. So we all have this opportunity. Now, I will say, if you do this, you better tip. Now, you can also, if you want to, you can, you can leave a track. Now, if you leave a track and no tip, I don't like you. Because I used to work at a restaurant, and Christians would come in, work me harder than anybody else, and then leave me a track. Oh, I'm thankful to Jesus for you. Little did they know I worked at a church at that time. And I prayed that they would go and meet Jesus right there. No, I didn't. I, but it was sad to me for the other waiters and waitresses that were not believers because they would say, that's a bad church or that's a good church based on how the people tipped. It was amazing. And so go out of your way to do that, do things like this. Listen, you can also uh, uh, email your friends, check on your friends, pray for your friends. Or if you see that your friends are struggling on Facebook, you can send them a private note. Hey, I just want you to know I'm praying for you as you go through this. Nothing wrong with that. One of the neatest things that has happened is a couple of times when I've put signs in my yard. You know, one of the worst things that can happen is when somebody finds out you're a pastor. Just so you know, it's very awkward at weddings. I do the, do the wedding and, and people always say, oh, pastor, please come to the reception. We're going to sit you at the table. And they sit me at the table and you should see people. I'm going to film it sometime. When I go to sit down at a table, you should see the other people at the table. I guess the host hates us. I mean, I just, right? Like I'm just going to mess up everything. It's really fun, been funny over the years. But here's the deal. So put a sign in my yard. It has a church web address. I've got a neighbor who said to me, that was a great sermon today. I'm trying to think, did I talk about them during the sermon? Right? This one neighbor has been watching online, ha had me watch their yard for them this, these last few weeks. Said, you know, I guess they figured they could trust me. He said, hey, I want you, we're going out of town. Would you kind of just keep a house on the house? So I, I would go through and blow off the driveway with my lawnmower, and I got a text. Hey, was that you in our yard? So the next time I went by, I went by and went at the camera, and she sent me a video of me driving through the yard going, hey, you know, on the camera. Listen, you never know when you go out of your way to pray for somebody or to encourage somebody or to give them a card saying, I'm praying for you, 
how God's going to use that. So do it. Go out of your way. Ask someone this week how you can pray for them. I'm going to skip that next quote. Let's go on to number three. Help others find their way home. I wish as believers we were as encouraging about going to church or, or being a Christian or, or finding Jesus as we are about Bucky's. I've been discipled. I haven't been to Bucky's yet, but I can tell you all about it. I've seen pictures of it. I've seen people go. I've seen people before they go post that they're getting ready to go. And then they go post pictures about going. And then after they go, they post how excited they were to be there and get this and that and the other. But very few, few people said, I went to church this morning. God really blessed me. Or I'm here this morning, even though I'm half asleep. Whatever you want to put. Our pastor gives me the best sleep of the week. Whatever you want to put in the thing, right? And, and the truth is that too often we're more excited about things that don't make a difference in our lives. And you're like, well, you haven't been to Bucky's yet. <laughs> than we are about what God can do in somebody's life. If God has really changed your life, start to think of, well, don't I want that for other people? I want them to find their way home. You know, our purpose statement at our church talks about that. Here it is. We want to help people find their way home to Christ. Why? So they can grow in love with him and then invite others home to Christ. And so we're glad to know Jesus, but are we glad to help other people to find their way home? Listen to what it says in James 5, 19. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring the person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. When's the last time you noticed somebody that hadn't been around or hadn't attended or you weren't sure felt well? And you went out of your way to say, hey, are you doing okay? Just to check on people. Just to go out of your way to say, hey, you've been discouraged. Let me tell you one of the neatest stories in our church. This lady went to a counselor and the counselor said, you know what you need? This is not a Christian counselor. They said, she said, you know what you need? You need to go to church. And so the lady showed up, and here's what she said to me when she came to church. Well, counselor told me I need to be here because I have an anger problem, so here I am. She later became a Christian. I got to baptize her and her future husband, and I got to do their wedding on the beach. You never know when you take those opportunities to say to people, can I pray for you? Are you doing okay? Do you want to come to church with me? A member called me last Saturday night and said, my friends came to church with me. I said, really? How'd that happen? She said, I invited them. She said, it's like you said, if you invite them, sometimes they come. I go, yeah, isn't that crazy? Go out of your way to, go, to say to somebody, hey, are you a believer? Or to say to them, hey, you want to come to church with me? My pastor's psychotic. You ought to see him. Whatever you want to say. Jesus said it this way, Matthew 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Now, just this year, my mom got a picture of her, is it her great-grandfather? Because it's my grandfather's grandfather. Okay, did I get that right? Her great-grandfather. She got a picture of him. It's funny, he's got the longest beard. He looks like one of those guys that has the, the, the flask under the beard, you know, where they pull it out and pull it out, right? He's got this long beard, and he's in this picture. But the saddest story in our family comes from that great-great, you do the number, grandfather. About the time of the Civil War, he left home. And there's Two stories about it. One is he left home about eight, eight years old to go to the Civil War. The other is that he left home about eight years old to go find work. But either way, about eight years old, he left home in the 1800s. And when he came home after that time, he couldn't find home. And so every Sunday, my mom said he would come. My grandfather got a Model A, a Ford. And he would come and say to my grandfather, hey, let's go for a ride. And they'd go riding around in the country and then come home and he would say, well, we didn't find it today. The rest of his life, any time that he could, he went looking for home. But he never found his way home. Do you realize that you have found your way home? But so many people around you haven't? 
Many of them know they're missing something. They know there's something not right. And here's the deal. God may have blended your life in just the right way so that you have just the right friendship, just the right relationship, just the right timing to say to that person, you know, I know the way home. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said he was the way to heaven. And you can help other people find their way home. Whatever step you need to take, whether it's taking a track and actually sharing the entire gospel with them, or just saying to them, can I pray for you? Or saying, do you want to come to church with me? Can I be here for you? When you go out of your way, even as you struggle, even as you have to be patient and pray in your own life, when you look around and say, God, how do you want me to help others find their way home? It changes your perspective. And my hope is that nobody will be able to say, nobody helped me to find my way home. But that others will say, thank you for helping me find my way home. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'll be here after the service. And you can surrender your life to him if you want to do that. If you're here today and the truth is God put somebody on your heart that you need to share with, just begin praying, God, would you show me how to do that the right way? How to invite them? how to encourage them, how to bless them, how to go out of my way for them. And just ask God to show you how to do that. And this week, if you're going through that time of patience, I encourage you, hey, in the middle of that, recognize how close God is. That he's walking with you and he can use you in the hardest times of your life. Let's close in prayer today. Would you join me? Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for each one that's here, I pray. Lord, number one, if anyone's here that doesn't know you or watching online, that they would come home to you. Lord, I pray also as a church, we wouldn't just be satisfied being home, but we would help others to find their way home. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your love for us. Lord, thank you that you welcome us home with open arms. So Lord, today I pray, give us your hands, give us your feet, put people on our minds and hearts. And Lord, also, as we walk through these things in our lives where we need patience, we need to be steady, that we would know your presence. Lord, be with that one today who's really struggling, even this morning, that they would know your presence in the middle of their struggle. Thank you for this time today. In Jesus' name, amen.